Okay. So I'd like to welcome you all to the final talk, the final panel discussion um, in Digital Futures World. Um, it's not the final session. We actually have a, a closing ceremony. I was going to say to tomorrow, but actually in some countries in China, it's going to be tonight. Um, uh, it's, I always like to kind of finish off or try and choreograph things to end with a kind of like a fireworks display with a kind of finale, a grand finale. And, um, and, and, and this, this, I think, is going to be a very special session. Um, we have uh, some very, uh, very special people here today. Let me start off with um, Ciro Nathi, um, who is chairing this session. Um, Ciro is currently the, the Dean of Ditella. But like many people in, um, in, on this panel today, he's been, I guess, a bit of a nomad um, during his career. Originally, I think his family came from, came from Italy. Uh, he was teaching at the AA a few years back and uh, running, I think, what was the most popular unit um, uh, in the whole AA. Um, uh, subsequent to that, he went to go and teach uh, uh, in Cornell and, and Harvard, uh, and now he's in Ditella. Um, and Cyril, I think, could be kind of like, in a way, in many ways, kind of is nomadic, not just in his kind of his his um, his kind of his his his, his academic kind of positions, but also nomadic in terms of his thinking. Very a kind of Deleuzean, Rosomatic, and, and deterritorialized, shall we say, in many ways. Um, Cyril actually went to the when he started teaching at the A. He followed on from our next guest, Alejandro Zarapolo, um, who, together with Tashid Masavi, ran the the unit that before that was the most popular there. Um, Alejandro might not remember this, but back in 2001, um, we invited him and, and, and uh, Fashid to an event called eFutures, which was the first of my ever ventures into the, into the, into the world of computation, and a lot has happened since then. Um, so for, uh, Alejandro himself is, is from Spain. He studied in Madrid before going on to, the, to, to study the GSD. Um, he came back to, to, uh, came to, back to Europe and established uh, uh, Foreign Office Architects, I think, which is kind of in a way that name foreign office architects is kind of interesting in its own way um, because it's symptom is a symptom of everything else. In a way, teaching at the AA is itself a kind of interesting place because it's a kind of it's a it's a foreign body. I think in London, I mean, nobody that my students were any of them were from from the UK, and it was also I think deterritorialized in terms of its way of thinking. So um, subsequent to that, uh, Alejandro went to went to become the dean at the at, uh, the Bell Lager. Um, and to teach, at, to, to hold the Norman Foster Visiting Professorship, the first one uh, at Yale University, um, and then eventually went on to become the Dean at Princeton. He is still at Princeton, um, and now he's no longer, the FOA has been disbanded, and now he has his own practice. Um, uh, 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 so anyway, finally, and I'm introducing someone who's not just here, but in many ways, um, um, He's also, I guess, probably one of his most kind of uh, uh, deterritorialized people. That's Sanford Quinter. Sanford Quinter is, is um, originally uh, from Canada. He went to go and study in, in, in Paris um, under Michel <laughs> Foucault, came back and then um, taught a number of places. First, uh, I think his first full-time post was at, uh, in Rice uh, under Lars Lerup. Um, subsequent to that, uh, he went to teach at MIT and Harvard GSD. When he left the GSD, I actually took his place for a while. Um, and he's currently <clears throat> at Pratt. When I say these things at, it's kind of it's difficult to say actually what I mean by at right now because because of this this the world in which we're operating. I mean, Sanford has been with me for the last week. Um, we've been teaching a theory workshop, which has been an incredible privilege for me and I think all for the students as well. And Sanford has been everywhere. Sanford has been in the kind of living rooms, everyone throughout the world, which is something very special about what's happening here. I think we're we're no longer kind of in any one place, but we're we're everywhere at the same time. Also, in terms of kind of timing, it's kind of it's, it's it's an interesting sort of moment because today is actually it's the third of July in 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 the states. Uh, in China, it's already the fourth of July. We're in this kind of weird situation whereby um, uh, time is kind of like in a, in a in a very strange state. We always thought about digital futures as being about the future, and in some ways, the future is already here. Um, all the things we were kind of predicting about a, a world in which we would operate through Zoom and so on. It, it's here uh, and we're doing precisely that. So the idea of the future being here present, it's literally here. I often think about the term that uh, Wolf Prix uses, to today, tomorrow will be yesterday. Well, today is already tomorrow in some senses. So we've, be, we've been in a kind of strange uh, situation the last few months, uh, losing track of time and place. Um, Anyway, it's it's wonderful to be able to finish to mark at the end of these 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 talks with um, uh, this session with Ciro Nakli, uh, um, curated by Ciro. So I will hand over to Ciro, who will uh, introduce the topic of tonight's conversation. Thank you, Neil. Thank you for the introduction. And 
uh, for the invitation to do this. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's been a very interesting week. I've been listening to some of the of the activities and, and they, they have been moving around across uh, different people. Um, and I'm very honored to be part of this, uh, to sharing this table with uh, Alejandro and Sanford. The idea is that we are going to have a kind of, I'm going to do a quick introduction to, to set the ground for, for the discussion. Then um, our guests are going to do um, presentations, short presentations, um, uh, triggered by the by the sort of brief I'm proposing, and then after that we're going to start the conversation, uh, hopefully. So uh, the table is called Shit Show Architecture, and I'm going to read a sort of. It appears to be like a manifesto, but actually it's more like thinking aloud a number of questions, or or actually a single question with different forms that I'm asking myself, and I, th I thought it was uh, interesting to put on the table. So here it goes. Vroom, boom, kaboom, pow, kapow, splat, sap, poof, cuckoo, whoops, gulp, crack, bing, bang, bong, boing, bam, splash, crash, ouch, arg, pop, huh, wow, ha ha ha, wham, wuhan, Oh, not the tempered prediction of serious and grave post-pandemic scenarios, but the feverish across the board conjecture of a perpetual pandemic reality. The world seen by an absolute outsider today is an out of control feast of extreme idiosyncratic forms emerging by the minute of radically nonsensical cultural expressions reacting to an unprecedented liminal situation. Globalization has come to mean that there is absolutely nowhere to escape from the blank malice of Mother Earth, as we have made it. Across all levels, we are living the ultimate all-encompassing reality, not just a global crisis, but the crisis at home. And the multifarious responses appear not simply as a plural rationality, but as a mess with peculiar effects and irrational byproducts operating beyond prediction, much less under any strategical plan. The ultimate form of nihilism has arrived and has indelibly settled. Skeptical surprise, withdrawn self-removal, indolent apathy, endless negligence, sheer incompetence, melancholy, desperation, wild hysteria, abstract inoffensive violence, absoluteness, blindness, clumsy homemade solutions and novel forms of wisdom configure the tragicomically radical setup that we live in today. The future has collapsed in the, in the pure present. The pandemic world is an onomatopoietically multifarious globe, a thin, flimsy, insubstantial tableau of order that utters electrifying nuances and singularities and implodes inwards as a spherically sealed container. Exhilarating forms take over the hyperculturalization of culture and take it to its ultimate level, a limbo of incongruent forces drifting over one another. So the question tonight is, what is the architectural form of this irreducibly heterogeneous, ubiquitous shit show? In other words, what kind of architecture is the architecture of the minutely shattered and yet strangely united totality that appears as a gig in a global state of trance? As extraordinary and unprecedented as this sounds, the architecture that flips literally flips this shit show from within by embracing it and literally comprehending it without cynicism and without naivety either, but rather with ingenuity, courage, deliberate candidness, kindness and serenity. What kind of architecture is the architecture that unguardedly corresponds and responds to the unrestricted, established, naturalistic forms of nationalism and conservatism operating disjointedly but concertedly at a global scale? of the crystallization of ever wilder, sharper, and resourceful forms of the far right and of the loud, customarily populist and structurally inhibited forms of the left that have become unlikely quirky caricatures. What kind of architecture is the architecture of the severe dominant technologies of control and restriction that paradoxically enable and promote the unfolding of subterranean open-ended forms of exchange and trade of materials and intangibles? the architecture of the extreme double discourse, 
of the bold simultaneity of frank hypocrisy, the architecture that neither celebrates nor moralistically criticizes the institu institutionalization of fake. What kind of architecture is the architecture of idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic localities endorsed as forms of value only to reaffirm that there is or there appears to be no value? Of uncanny traditions and tied and as universalizable truths under the safe umbrella of the post truth, of sickening habits that adopt the form of the peculiar to project themselves, exert impact, and instigate frighteningly unpredictable global effects. What kind of architecture is the architecture of demagogy and weakness? What kind of architecture is the architecture that escalates partial and slanted rationalities to the heights of an apparent? status of consensus and new normality, the architecture of the resulting settlement and stabilization of absurdity and irrationality, the architecture of well-balanced, harmonious nonsensicality, of judicious lunacy, of the mutual sustenance, sustenance, furtherance, and even cooperation between mutually exclusive forms of self-referentiality. What kind of architecture is the architecture of such an astonishing conglomeration of disparate modes of survival, transparently exposed, prematurely systematized, and rendered into models of one another? The architecture of systematic forms of imprudence based on apparently commonsensical inoffensive logics. The architecture of the amicably hostile mutual exclusion, the architecture of the consonance of dissonance. What kind of architecture is the architecture of creepy, agreed upon forms of confinement, of quarantine modes that have come to crystallize the dominant models of extensive elimination of difference through the fueling, fueling of apparent diversity, the architecture of manifolds of virtually sealed envelopes, apparently nested within one another, that actually cross and dangerously overlay in a sort of collective, uninterrupted, uninterrupted massive glitch. What kind of architecture is architecture res resulting of this overtly divergent form of agreement? The architecture of the perpetual oscillation between wild and or correct ecologics and economics, health and wealth in general. The architecture of the foolish consumption of ideas and of the stubborn misuse of resources that accumulates into a coherent plethora of waste and surplus. The architecture of, distress, of a distressed global rationale. What kind of architecture is architecture that instead of celebrating its circumstances or neglecting them through self-isolation, embraces this all-encompassing denial in real time and turns the presumably terminal pandemic panorama into an authentic land of promises. The architecture of a completely new kind of excess, a negative excess, which operates not merely through abundance, but by means of the voracious integration of incompatible contradictions. What modalities does this architecture have? What are its favorite techniques, its types to come, its expertise, its technologies, its cultural tone, and particularly the unprecedented forms of its objects? So with that, I'm going to, to pass the word to, to um, both Alejandro and Sanford, uh, starting with, with Alejandro. And thank you for coming both to you. You are mute, Alejandro. Unmute. Okay, can you see my screen now or not? We can see you. Can you you cannot see the screen? No, just no. you. No. Okay, so let me see share screen, of course. <laughs> okay, can you see it now? Yes. Okay, great. So, uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to be um, here uh, tonight with uh, with um, very old uh, friends. I mean, to, to the to the introduction that Neil uh, made, I would like to add that there is a kind of direct lineage here because I was a student of Sanford at GSD. And, and Ciro was not my student, was never my student, but he was my assistant at some point. So there's a kind of uh, uh, long uh, complicity, I think, between 
between us, hopefully Sanford will will. Well, you know, uh, you know what Bob Dylan said. He said, uh, "Well, something like the leaders now will soon be last." That's what I feel has happened. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm glad you are you are here, Sanford. Uh, uh, I, I didn't know that you you were going to show up. Uh, uh, so so anyway, um, I I wanted to to uh, use this opportunity to um, talk about a number of things that I've been working on. Uh, for 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 a few years now, and uh, and that I think um, have uh, uh, it's a kind of uh, uh, an opportunity to put forward a kind of series of polemics uh, that that I think have become now particularly relevant in in, in my view uh, with this uh, COVID nineteen <clears throat> uh, situation, and and I would like to say that uh, in sight of the of uh, serious uh, provocation opening line of the. Of the shit show, I, I'm gonna uh, try to uh, retrieve uh, some sort of arcane uh, role of the architect, which is the one of the alchemist who turns uh, shit into gold. Uh, and so, uh, I, I, I would like to, to also be slightly um, optimistic about uh, about uh, uh, the situation. I, I think that uh, that actually COVID-19 opens certain possibilities that, that, uh, that I would like to, to explore with, uh, with you all now. And I would like to start with, uh, <clears throat> with a citation from, from Daniel Dennett, who is a, uh, an, an apologetic Darwinist, uh, uh, who, who starts uh, saying postmodern is the school of thought that proclaimed there are no truths, only interpretations, has largely played itself out in absurdity but it has left behind a generation of academics in the humanities disabled by the distrust of the very idea of truth and their disrespect for evidence settling for conversations in which nobody is wrong and nothing can be confirmed, only asserted with whatever style uh, you can master. Uh, so what I think is, is interesting about, uh, about the situation of, uh, of COVID is that it, it uh, may be uh, actually the, the end of uh, postmodernism, I, I remember talking to uh, Charles Jenks uh, maybe a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, uh, and he said, "No, we are still uh, in postmodernism, uh, whether you believe it or, or not." And I think he was he was right. Uh, I, I I think that the argument that I would like to to, to present here is that <clears throat> that postmodernism was a was a was a um, Tendency or a, or, a, or a trend that, uh, or, or maybe a whole lifestyle and, and system of knowledge that uh, where, where uh, interpretation was prevailing uh, over, over evidence. And, and I think architecture, architects, like many other intellectuals, became, uh, became accomplices in, in this uh, huge business of interpretation and difference uh, uh, and, and uh, and I, I think that, unfortunately, that was perhaps uh, utilized by intelligent design proponents and climate change deniers, um, uh, um, which I, I believe only exist because the whole intellectual machine of that era was geared up to respect all opinions for the sake of promoting diversity and create false uh, inclusive uh, complexity. And so I think COVID-19 perhaps uh, ends up that uh, that uh, approach and opens what I I would like to call the after post uh, truth. Uh, uh, that's in some ways the title of the of the presentation, uh, in which perhaps a, another uh, era uh, will emerge that uh, uh, will go over where we are now, which is here. So this is where the world. Uh, for that this respect for diversity and interpretation has uh, led us uh, led us to and I, I think that perhaps now there's a moment in which we have to be a little bit less respectful for opinions and positions and interpretations and a bit more committed to evidence uh, so this world uh, in this world lying has become uh, legitimate uh, because that is said since there is no truth anything anything goes you can buy uh, virtual constituencies, uh, you can win uh, uh, amazingly uh, elections and talk, and, and now I'm going to engage with the question of, of populism, uh, uh, because uh, populists have um, succeeded to exploit 
that situation uh, and, and claim uh, new forms of authenticity or maybe truth. Uh, so the blue collar workers, the farmers, the fishermen against the global stock market speculators and the experts and the return of uh, the patriots, the industrial nationalists. Uh, I, I, I think that that's, that's basically where that intellectual machine has uh, led us. And, 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 and funnily enough, these guys have the best data experts. Uh, so <clears throat> there is an, a whole uh, uh, set of very intelligent people not necessarily strongly uh, aligned ideologically to to, uh, to the populists, but uh, st still operating underneath, uh, uh, which I would I would uh, call the, the, the first uh, the first stream of or the first strand of um, scientific uh, populists who know that uh, that uh, machines vote and who are able to operate uh, bots and trolls and data and psyops and astroturfing uh, as a way to, to deliver uh, wins to, to, uh, to these maybe dumb uh, populists that, uh, that, they are, that they are serving. So these kind of um, scientific populists in a way uh, lay down the, the, the ground of, of what I am <coughs> going, where, I, where I'm going next. I think it's very interesting to, to, to see what these guys are. They are computer scientists, Robert Mercer, uh, one of the biggest donor to the, to the uh, Republican Party, Dominic Cummings, the, 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 the cabinet chief of uh, Boris Johnson, uh, and also a kind of uh, data, um, I don't know if scientist, but certainly somebody who is very committed to data, but more interestingly for architecture, and this is where uh, you know I'm trying to ground uh, what may be the, the the future of architecture. We have people like Steve Bannon, who is, uh, if we you didn't know, an architect by by training. Uh, his undergrad degree is architecture. Or Christopher Wiley, which is the the, the, the famous whistleblower of the Cambridge Analytica uh, affair, who is a data. A scientist, but also an expert in uh, uh, an expert in fashion, and, and so fashion is uh, is uh, is uh, very interesting to both of these guys. You know, Steve Bannon wearing his trademark double black shirt, like a double camiche anera. He's an, an a kind of um, uh, enthusiast of uh, Mussolini, so he has two black uh, shirts on top of each other. Um, uh, and actually, uh, th th these people are also able to conceive uh, uh, or to operate within within entirely new uh, worlds. Uh, uh, Steve Bannon was actually the CEO of uh, of the Biosphere uh, Two, which is a, a closed uh, the, is the largest closed uh, Earth system ever uh, uh, created. So new realities, new natures. Uh, um, uh, design, fashion is really at the very core of, uh, of this. Um, uh, Christopher Wiley has now been hired by H&M as it, its consulting uh, director of, of research. These people are very much into design uh, and they are an integral part of, the, of, the, uh, of this uh, scientific uh, populist uh, strand. Which, which I, I think may collapse uh, uh, as a result of what is happening now, which is that uh, you know the, the uh, Trump, uh, Bolsonaro, this says India, but actually this is Russia. So Putin and Johnson are at the top of the league of uh, uh, of contagion of uh, Corona uh, virus. So their success is being measured in in body uh, counts, and I think that's maybe one of the reasons why I see some opportunity here, uh, maybe some, oppor some opportunity that will bring back uh, what I, I mean, or, or an opportunity that I think will uh, suggest a, a scenario where, where a, a kind of radical rehabilitation of scientific truth in architecture uh, is of uh, rigor, a kind of scientific turn, a return to evidence, expertise, me measurability, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I believe that maybe that is the opportunity uh, that uh, opens before us. And, and 
to, to the idea of the populist uh, uh, scientists uh, or the sci scientific populist uh, uh, that, that I was uh, uh, mentioning before, I, I would like to introduce another maybe interesting uh, theme for, for this whole uh, new era, which, which is the, the question of the, of the post-human. So we uh, have now tools that we didn't have uh, before that enable us to see reality um, uh, realities that we couldn't couldn't see before. Data mining, uh, sensing, artificial sensing are some of these uh, <clears throat> maybe devices that we can use in order to approximate new forms of truth that are no longer um, uh, human, uh, that are not based on human uh, sensibility, and that may give us uh, uh, entirely. I mean, this is a, a, a kind of a joke, but but I think that that uh, technologies like correlation of, uh, of data in data mining can actually bring forward new uh, truths that we couldn't even <clears throat> imagine, imagine uh, before. And these are um, uh, this kind of radical measurability of uh, or new me artificial measurability of, of reality may yield these uh, new forms of, um, of truth. So this would be what we could call the, the uh, as opposed to the type of truth that is being created by, by scientific populists uh, through, uh, through some of these uh, tools, maybe we can conceive uh, of a, of a, of a post-human truth, a truth that is no longer based on human sensibility, uh, but on artificial <coughs> sensing data collection, and also a, a, a truth that, that transcends the, the, the anthropocentric uh, perception of the universe and, and expands into uh, perhaps other constituencies uh, that have not been um, part of, of architecture so, so far. There, is a, <clears throat> uh, there, are, there are new technologies, as I was uh, saying before, where uh, the, the, the measurability uh, is uh, crucial, where the naked eye, the naked human eye is insufficient and where the minute detail of the face uh, is uh, much more important than the obvious uh, gesture. Uh, I, I think that uh, that that this is uh, maybe uh, some of the um, the question of detail, the question of measurability, uh, uh, the the question of measurability that is new because uh, we couldn't have it before, but we can have it now is is important, and and this uh, whole. Uh, situation is, is perhaps also pitched against, <clears throat> against I, I don't know whether it's against, but, but yes, against, because this is a polemic and I, I like it to be a polemic. I, I believe polemics are, are very important and I think is, uh, is uh, a very important tool of, uh, of knowledge. Uh, and since uh, architecture in the last few years has been uh, particularly interested in, in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, perhaps engaging uh, with uh, uh, with uh, activism in a, in a different way, not in the in the uh, but different forms of populism. Maybe maybe activism or certain types of activism are also uh, part of uh, of the 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 scene that I think will be phased out uh, by by this uh, scientific uh, turn. I wanted to basically uh, pitch the 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 proposal tonight. Uh, also to, to, to say maybe there is uh, an alternative to, um, um, to this, this kind of activist uh, populism that in, in which, in which uh, uh, architects have tried to, to engage uh, with more or less success in the, in the last uh, few years in which you know, gender and, uh, and uh, race and identity and, uh, <clears throat> and class um, have, have become uh, 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 the, the, the center of, uh, of, of some potential architectural uh, discourse. Uh, but, but I think that the, the, and the I, I, I stop here because I think it's, it, this, is, this is the Gillette, the, the protest of the Gillette region, uh, uh, which, uh, which uh, were actually fighting against uh, uh, carbon taxes imposed by, the, by, the, by Macron. Uh, so the, here we have uh, some sort of class struggle in uh, opposition to uh, maybe um, uh, nature or, or, 
or um, some sort of uh, consciousness that goes beyond uh, human struggles, human-based uh, uh, struggles. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to go through through these, but that, but so uh, some of these uh, these uh, these kind of uh, uh, problems uh, uh, have been part of of uh, of my activities in the last few years. This uh, was the 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 outcome of the, uh, the book the, that came out of the, the Seoul Biennale in 2017 that was, was called Imminent Commons, but, but maybe could have been called uh, in, in, in relation to, to these uh, uh, ideas that I just mentioned, the post-human uh, city, in the sense that uh, the, the main idea of the Biennale, <coughs> uh, of the whole Biennale, was that uh, cities are no longer, uh, or the crucial issues that cities need to deal with are not, no longer um, no longer uh, about uh, human issues like, you know, activism uh, had, has tried to uh, to put forward, but actually by non-human uh, uh, problems, by, by by questions of uh, of ecology, questions of uh, of technology. That's where the, the big challenges for for the the, the the city of the near future. Uh, lie on so the, the idea was you know uh, uh, modern and and, and uh, postmodern urbanism is uh, still very much based on on functions human functions but also communities identities as uh, as the as the core of of these uh, doctrines but now we we have new constituencies we have machines uh, working with us we have <coughs> we have to to, uh, to start thinking about how we are transforming nature, how we are transforming the, the earth. Those are, I think, the, the, the maybe the, the, the challenges that, that are re-emerging with, with some of the consciousness that we are, we are um, uh, gaining from, from this experience of, of COVID. The other issue, the question of, of uh, the, the scientific turn, uh, rigor, precision, uh, detailed, uh, detailed analysis uh, rather than gesture, uh, it was uh, part of, of the research that they did on the on the on the envelope, which is about to be published. Finally, uh, which came out uh, of this observation of uh, building envelopes uh, and the realization that actually the details of the buildings were far more interesting than the buildings themselves, uh, and, and so that led into a, a whole uh, research in which. You know, against what uh, what architects used to do in the past, which is to design facades like like uh, you know the the <coughs> um, the Seagram building with these kind of parallel lines uh, in a, in a certain composition, we go into what happens within those lines. And within those lines, what happens is that there is a number of uh, devices that are uh, performed in detail. Uh, and that I think uh, manipulate very charged issues today: air, water, energy, daylight, views through coal bridges, drainage channels, thermal barriers, mechanical fixings, air leakage. I mean, how are we going to be able to explain this after an an, an age in which architecture has become, uh, um, or the, the the architecture clientele has become uh, accustomed to to very um, very noisy uh, gestures. Uh, I, I don't know. I think it may be one of the, the, the chances uh, that, that, we, uh, that we have uh, before us and that will uh, perhaps do away with, with phenomenology and uh, tectonics, which have been the, the two uh, pillars of what I think now is a, is a conservative um, uh, conservative approach uh, to, um, to uh, building, uh, to the, the, the act of, uh, of building. Uh, so these are also some other investigations that we, we have been doing lately. And this is actually more Maider than, than me. Uh, Maider is my partner, and she's an architect, but she's also a scientist and has been working on this city reader kit uh, that uh, aims at low cost, high spatial temporal environmental sensing, which is basically a system that uh, while installed in, uh, in vehicles moving through the city can give us real time information about a number of uh, environmental uh, parameters. So I, I, I think that this, this idea of being able to 
look or, and literally create uh, technologies that uh, will enable us to see uh, <clears throat> uh, to see uh, cities in a different light are, uh, for example, like this are are maybe interesting. And, and the last uh, the last uh, statement that I wanted to make uh, tonight, and, and maybe this is the most the most uh, polemical uh, uh, one uh, is that that actually in terms of architecture, what uh, what I think is uh, is uh, interesting to me is that before or uh, in the kind of postmodern city we had the kind of city of exception, we have the extravagant gesture, uh, and I uh, sense uh, that maybe this new situation is is uh, is going to accelerate, intensify something that I think has been already happening for, <clears throat> for some time, looking at, uh, at what people are interested in, uh, which, is, uh, which is that we, uh, or what I sense is that architecture uh, of the recent past was primarily uh, driven to, towards what is new. Uh, and I, I think architecture in the near future uh, would uh, be uh, grounded or would be driven uh, to what is what has been preserved, what has, uh, has been conserved. And, and so if you look at, at uh, maybe the, 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 the kind of public, um, um, so you conserve water, you conserve uh, energy, uh, you conserve biodiversity, you conserve biology, you conserve the environment, you, you recycle cities or you make cities resilient. Uh, so I, I think there is a whole trend that is going to put an enormous pressure uh, as a result of this kind of uh, um, uh, more uh, ecological approach about some sort of, uh, some sort of con conserv not so much conservative. And I think this is where, where, where for me, this becomes uh, fascinating. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, conservationist, uh, and so uh, so. I mean, it's also interesting that that Generation C, which is the generation born in, in uh, after 1995, uh, is seemingly the most conservative generation since uh, 1945. And, and and many of these people are actually uh, calling back uh, to Darwin. This this kind of uh, special uh, uh, position for for uh, Sanford to. To attack immediately, immediately after. So, so the the, the idea that I would like to uh, to propose here is that there is uh, maybe a room to explore a type of architecture that is <clears throat> that is uh, uh, that is conservationist uh, or maybe is conservative. I don't know. I don't know how to how to how to call this. But but uh, where, for example, uh, symmetry or repetition or, um, or uh, uh, compactness or, uh, or uh, a, a number of, uh, or gravity, uh, which were in some ways values that were discarded from, uh, from architecture because they were associated to the representation of forms of authority may come back not as a representation of forms of authority, but as, a, as simple devices of, uh, performance uh, and 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 so I I think that uh, I mean I I call uh, uh, as a kind of joke uh, some sort of neocon uh, the return of a neocon architecture where where things that uh, were discarded uh, from from the the viable repertoire of uh, uh, advanced architecture before may actually uh, come. <clears throat> Come back. So the question here is: is is, is it is it conceivable that uh, we have a, a progressive uh, conservative architecture uh, as opposed to to a kind of regression uh, into the the avant-garde, the permanent avant-garde, the the the, <coughs> the idea that uh, <coughs> that I mean, is is this going to be uh, uh, enable us to escape from cultural preservation identity? Tectonics, phenomenology, uh, and once we get get rid of it, can we actually uh, uh, find a, a progressive architecture in 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 some of the architectural traits that were discarded discarded previously as as um, uh, conservative? Uh, so 
So uh, I mean, and I, so I wanted to to bring this project, which is a, a project, and I finish with this. Uh, I know I'm I'm out of uh, uh, the time. <coughs> it's a project that <coughs> I didn't quite finish um, in 2008. Uh, it's a project in Madrid. Uh, which was designed uh, for what is, was called uh, then the, the City of Justice. Uh, uh, and I didn't finish this project. It was, it was uh, uh, done, the, the facade was done by somebody else because I had resigned uh, halfway through the, uh, through the process. But uh, it was designed for the central morgue of Madrid. And it was never open because then the whole project of the City of Justice uh, uh, collapsed. And uh, uh, this this was basically the, the the original design, which was was based on a, some sort of spherical game, <clears throat> entirely symmetrical, entirely uh, regular, uh, entirely uh, repetitive. This was the, the the kind of topology of this uh, envelope that was uh, containing the the the, the morgue, which, which I now look uh, back at uh, as maybe some sort of. <clears throat> of, uh, of uh, uh, conservational uh, or, or the beginning of uh, maybe a possibility for a, for a, for a neoconservative uh, uh, approach to, to architecture that I have been interested in, in developing for, uh, for uh, some uh, time. And, and I think what is more interesting about this project, which was never, uh, never uh, open as a, <clears throat> as a building is that uh, and I'm just kind of showing uh, simply images of uh, of this uh, uh, this uh, design that that was not executed as as planned, <clears throat> but was built. And, and these are pictures of, of the building in their current state. But what was most what is most exciting about uh, this little story that the client, by the way, is, is in prison now for for corruption. The, the guy who, <coughs> who who fired me. Or actually, did I resigned? He didn't fire me. But but so what, what is interesting is that is that this uh, this project was uh, retrieved by I mean this project had built inside 250 um, um, uh, uh, fridges for bodies because it was the morgue. It was planned as the central morgue of Madrid. It was never open, but because of the 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 pandemic. Uh, in Madrid, <clears throat> it was suddenly uh, reopened. So they, they basically activated everything. Everything was nearly ready. It was rusting uh, away. So these are images of these, uh, of these um, uh, fridges uh, for bodies that uh, existed already in the building and that have become actually used as part of the, the pandemic. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of uh, funny, uh, story of a building that perhaps have has some of the traits that, that I, I think uh, may become increasingly interesting to explore uh, in the in the near future and with which I, I wanted to uh, to finish the the, the presentation um, I, I don't think I mean I, I have a number of other projects but I think maybe we should go to uh, to Sanford's Presentation. Okay. Thank you, Alejandro. So, welcome, Sanford, to join us. Hey there. Okay, I got my screen. I think uh, you can hear me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, first of all, hello, Alejandro. Man, it's been a long <laughs> year, and. Uh, Feels like a bit of an eternity now also. Look, uh, first of all, I realize that we have streamers potentially who are watching this. In other words, this is, um, this is in some way public, but we're completely unaware of uh, who's out there, as opposed to all the other Zooms uh, that I've been doing here this week in which you get a sense of who's actually uh, participating because they're on the Zoom itself. Um, when I never actually, I got to tell you, I came completely unprepared. Uh, I'm going to tell you why. Uh, first, because I had absolutely no time, uh, as this uh, Zoom shit show seems to be absolutely never ending. 
I feel like uh, somebody is stealing my blood, my energy, my soul. And at the same time, they keep giving me something back, something interesting. Uh, the Zooms on this particular venue have had, uh, have had um, let's say, some revelation that uh, most of the Zooms uh, throughout this pandemic, at least for me, have not had. And I'm going to try to remember what I was thinking just now when I said that so I can come back to it. But I will say that um, I never read the brief, um, though I listened as carefully as I could just now when Ciro was speaking, because, um, the, uh, because Neil Leach sent me uh, the initial proposal of um, Ciro and asked me what I thought. And I laughed out loud. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And I said he should definitely make it happen. And then I heard from Neil, uh, I heard from uh, Ciro, and I told Ciro, look, I really don't have much time. I can't do this. I can't even focus on it. But if you get all these guys together, I will be there. Because I thought it was like going to be a big old reunion. Um, you know, I don't need to be reminded that I was uh, maybe uh, at one point somebody's uh, teacher in the room or that some of my students or not real students, in fact, really uh, collaborators, uh, yeah, then became uh, whatever. I think of all of us as uh, in a fluctuating, highly, um, uh, what is it called? Um, convective soup uh, in which we are constantly floating up to the top and then getting sucked back down to the bottom, all in the same soup together. And that is part of the, uh, the wondrousness, shall we say, of the mess that we're all in now. I like the fact that you know, sometimes in the old days, uh, when uh, guests uh, turned up unexpectedly, they used to say, we'll throw a little more water into the soup. Well, what's happening these days, of course, nobody's really got water anymore. Everybody's just throwing a lot more meat into the soup, a lot more vegetables into the soup. In fact, there's very little water, actually, uh, these days. The soup just keeps getting thicker, and we start to uh, absolutely, I, I would say, our vision and our, our sense of what the totality of it, it just gets gets uh, more and more uh, um, uh, uh, um, obstructed, shall we say. So in fact, I just said I would turn up and I figured I'd respond to these guys. And now it turns out here I am. I would say this though, is that I love those kind of PowerPoints that Alejandro just showed us. And I forgot about those PowerPoints because typically these days, I uh, the conferences or just let's say the, the, the meetings um, that I go to are no longer uh, this generation, you know, very typically there are others. And what I loved about this reminder, I mean, also I'm fascinated. What the hell do you do, Alejandro? Do you sort of just sit around and gather all these images? I mean, you know, read magazines. Uh, and, and, and every time you see something interesting, you actually grab it. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> um, because, you know, it seems like this shit is coming my way all the time. I don't have social media accounts, but everybody, I know does, and they are my social media accounts. They just send me stuff that they think's interesting, and I can't even keep up to it. I just think it's so bloody interesting. All this garbage that we keep getting thrown at us, it's just endlessly funny. It's endlessly rich. It makes no sense, and now it's become the new normal. So, anyways, on some level, maybe that's what Ciro was going on about. The next thing I want to say is that I was a little concerned. I didn't know how chummy to be with my old pals here because I didn't know if there were um, actually an audience out there. So I'm assuming uh, Neil uh, assured me. He said, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of people out there. And then he added a sentence. He said, but you guys are the fireworks at the end of the show. <laughs> So I said, wow, now I feel even doubly bad at having not prepared anything. But there was a couple of moments in the conversation, for example, where uh, I may have even missed it because um, I, had, um, I had a chat uh, screen open. And there may have been a picture, it seems to me there was a picture of Darwin and um, Alejandro was going on. And very soon afterward, he said, well, now I hope that Sanford will now attack me. And I want to just say that, yeah, I think I should attack you for something, <laughs> but I didn't, I missed it. So I think if we're going to have some fireworks, we have to have a kind of a, an scream battle. I, there have to be, there have to be uh, theatrical attacks and then there have to be parries and there have <laughs> to be reposts and there has to be, there has to be fireworks. So, okay. <clears throat> 
Now, in terms of being a straight man um, and and addressing the, um, shall I say, the ecstatic horrors of uh, what has emerged, I mean, one of the things that has struck me so much uh, in terms of, well, first of all, I want to tell you all, I don't know where you are living. I have a very sad feeling. We had some very dark moments in New York City. I have to tell you, there were times where I couldn't even go outside. Um, because the, well, frankly, because of the disappearance of so many of the people who I used to encounter on my dog walks and because there were literally vultures uh, fly, flying over the city uh, by mid-April because the gases of the uh, putrefying bodies were already being registered on the environment at an incredible distance and so on and so forth. But I want to say that for many of you, that darkness is probably just, uh, is still on its way. I don't know where Alejandro is. Are you here in the US or are you in Spain? Yes, 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 I am. I am in the Okay, US. well, Spain has gone through it beautifully. The Europeans, in fact, will get through it, have gotten through it beautifully. They'll have a few glitches um, uh, and blips, but- um, not, lot not, so, not so beautifully in Spain. <laughs> well, no, I mean, Spain had, had a mortality rate that was, that was grotesque, uh, yeah. <laughs> or where we know we know that the question of course is where they are now is where they are now um but there's some very ugly there's some very bad moments coming i know for many of you and um uh you know especially if you happen to be living in those places in the united states and the fact that united states is going down the drain as we speak and there doesn't <clears throat> be anybody willing or a, uh, who is able or uh, to do anything about it. I say that, but though at the same time, I wanted to express the idea that despite all of that, the feeling that we had been gifted with a Sabbath of a kind that since the rise of neoliberalism, we have not in fact experienced, um, was something that was palpable, at least to me, um, I, I'm not going to go on with all of the soppy other things that had to do with the uh, intensification of certain type of relationships, including the family, the people you live with, or let's just say in the broader sense, all of the kin, the people who were part of your biological bubble. Um, it was a fascinating thing, but I'm not going to go into it. Simply the idea that despite the economic disaster and how painful it was in a way for certain people, more than us, but still all of us, the Sabbath, the experience of a Sabbath, of the release from the perpetual driving dynamo of insecurity and uh, of, of attention toward productive capacity, it was really something extraordinary. And I think we will not forget it. I think we will not forget it. So the idea would be in a way to conserve and preserve that as part of the mess. And in fact, to remind ourselves that before, real, uh, before our economic lives, that's to say our everyday life, our urban lives, before they became rectified by, shall we say, economic rationality or increasingly so, life was a mess. Medieval life was a beautiful mess. The Renaissance was a beautiful mess, even the 18th century. I remember we published at Zone, we published books and um, about the 18th century. And I just remember reading all of this stuff, the way people would go out into the streets with their canes and their walking sticks and their umbrellas. And uh, they'd be very well dressed and love, beautifully perfumed and powdered. And they would walk around and it was absolutely de rigueur, that's to say absolutely normal for a group of uh, educated, uh, well-dressed, well-heeled um, uh, friends to pick around in the piles of excrement and examine what the person who, uh, who, who shat in the street uh, was eating and who they were. They would speculate on the whole ecology of the person who had basically defecated in the street. And I realized just the you know, we used to publish essays also on the unbelievable smells, the olfactory history of the European city. And of course, it doesn't apply only to a European city, but in fact, and continually to the cities all around the world. So what's fascinating, of course, is the, um, is the 
we can almost say the anthropological or even the race memory of that kind of shit show that has uh, come our way. But just to say really that there is not, there isn't only, shall we say, a celebration of the progress that took us away from that, but also the race memory almost, the, the memory, the, the, the memory of a, of, an, a, of a completely different way of being in the world. Um, I also think that there are elements of the shit show that we're experiencing um, on that level that may not be forgotten as we, as we move into the future, into the next uh, world or two. But I'm also suggesting that maybe we ought not forget it. Um, and maybe we ought not, but we don't have to fetishize it either. We don't have to write these fucking books about this kind of stuff. But really, certainly, really, in a way, simply assimilate it, it at, you know, at the level of, uh, of human experience. Um, I also want to say that I remember when Alejandro first presented that uh, little, that slide of Daniel Dennett. This is a bit of a non sequitur, but I remember we had, because of the last time we saw each other in Chicago, we were at a conference. And I remember when it came up and I started reading it, when I read the first half of it, I remember thinking to myself, you know, congratulations to you, Alejandro, for bringing that up. And, and I was ready to defend him. I was 100% ready to defend him. And by the, but then the room, I must tell you, I was utterly intimidated. The entire room almost, I mean, they started first to groan, then almost to yell. And I have to say, it was not a popular slide. It was not a popular slide. And I was intimidated. I just said, well, maybe I'm not going to try and <laughs> defend Alejandro just now. Uh, and largely because that year I had spent a lot of time in so-called learned rooms uh, in which I uh, found it absolutely unbearable to, to, uh, to sit among the consensus of uh, all-knowing and often deeply racist um, uh, 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 what, what is that word? Um, jingoistic is not the right word, but there's uh, all the emergence of all of these new cultures, and there's almost a kind of a fervent and frightening nationalism about all of these new cultures that have uh, that have popped up. The problem, of course, is that uh, Daniel Dennett, who is very rarely stupid, unfortunately, in my opinion, does fall into some really pathetic stupidity at the end of that little quote of his, meaning he could have paid, he could have spent a little more effort and a little more nuance in how he finished it up. So in the end, yeah, he came off as basically being um, a little bit, uh, shall we say, uh, unselfconscious and biased in a, in a not very interesting way. But nonetheless, we do need to understand that the, me that the, uh, that the that the space in which so many of the new cultures are have emerged, including what I'm referring to as perhaps some of the salvific mess that is being in a certain sense rediscovered or at least re uh, reactivated around us, is made possible by some very negative aspects uh, that are taking place in our culture, which in a sense, I have no idea what Alejandro actually said in his presentation. And he kept referring to something that would be polemical, maybe something that would be more polemical, or maybe something that should be polemical, but I never got the gist of it. So I was gonna ask him to restate it in maybe a phrase or two, but I would have to say that the invocation of those magazine covers um, and of the thing that is almost too banal to talk about, but it's very troubling, is simply what constitutes um, what constitutes the entry the entry um, conditions of a public statement today, and the fact that there does not seem to be any actual criterion. Now there was a well, what I'm talking about is the lie culture, the, the post-truth culture, et cetera, et cetera. That really may not be an interesting 
topic to many people who are uncomfortable or unwilling to appear conservative or traditional in any way, but it is, uh, it is uh, the name of, of, of a disaster whose depth and whose tentacles, frankly, have not yet been properly theorized, but which every human being really who cares about human destiny really ought to begin to search for ways to provide, shall we say, um, um, uh, charismatic arguments for as we go forward, because uh, that is not something that we are going to benefit by if we permit it, uh, if we can permit it uh, to continue or to happen. Um, the invocation of truth, I wanted to say, though, that um, Alejandro seems to be on the side of, by the way, Alejandro, I, I noticed the way you invoked the idea of, what was it? Um, the evoked the idea of, wow, something, I've been, and it occurred to me both, but I thought Alejandro was, um, had for, um, even for, shall we say, uh, argumentative or polemical or even stylistic reasons. I thought you had intentionally decided for a great number of years to flirt with neoconservative, um, um, uh, shall we say, ideas um, and tendencies. And I couldn't quite understand where you were seeking to situate yourself. But then again, here we go. In terms of the big data stuff, I don't know if you were suggesting that this was, these developments, these technical developments, these instrumental and these new forms of rationality, shall you say, are things that merited not only our attention, but in fact, our even, uh, shall we say, our, our naive uh, and even full engagement. Um, these extraordinary correlations that you present, which I suppose is the general internet culture, which generated those and not you yourself, I'm sure you picked these up because it's amazing how much ingenuity is actually, how much labor is going into the generation of nonsense and how that nonsense, once it begins to circulate, stops being nonsense. But what I did want to say is that these are, it's a bit hasty to describe these things as truths. Um, and yes, I do come from an epistemological school in which, of course, uh, Fundamentally, the material world and the physical culture around us is was seen to be intimately uh, connected, shall we say, and intimately co-structured by the organization and assembly and setting into motion, uh, shall we say, statements whose status was... Uh, ensured by a whole set of forces and structures to, to operate as truth. And what I really simply want to say is there is no truth without a context, without a political context, but also an epistemological context, but also a physical context by a realist context, if I could say, that um, activates it, shall we say. And in this sense, it's a little like Wittgenstein's um, 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 a statement that we heard earlier in these uh, Zooms this week, that the meaning of a word is its use. Um, and I would like to say that truth exists in an ecology, but it does exist. It is also true to say that it doesn't exist outside of that ecology. So I would like to say if it's, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to get, I want to get back to the thing though, I want to get back to the fight. I want to get back to the attack. And I also figure that one way to get back to the attack is to figure out what he had in mind somewhat close to, uh, to his presentation of the picture of Darwin. And I also would like uh, Alejandro, since I think he and I are the only uh, protagonists here, aside from, I, I suppose, Ciro, and ultimately I'm praying that Neil will come back. Um, I, I, I want to um, ask him if he could just state in a summary, one or two of the polemical things that you intended to say or that you in fact did say? 
Well, I, I, I think that maybe what is more, pole- more deliberately polemical about the whole presentation is the, the, the claim that, uh, that uh, after the kind of relentless speed uh, of uh, the, the, this kind of uh, neoliberal uh, uh, dedication to novelty, to the exploitation of the city of, uh, of uh, exceptions as uh, the place of uh, avant-garde uh, uh, architecture, uh, maybe, uh, and maybe the, the, the idea that uh, that architecture operates uh, as a kind of means of, primarily as a means of representation of some sort of political uh, political messages of uh, diversity, inclusiveness. Um, you know, anything goes because uh, this is the city of exceptions. I believe that maybe one of the things that are that are appearing in the in the horizon is uh, is a new form of and and this is maybe where Dennett is also uh, potentially uh, an interesting um, uh, an interesting reference uh, some sort of evolutionary uh, progressiveness as opposed to a progressiveness in architecture that is about uh, novelty and and what's new and and what's different, uh, and and so the idea that there is a that there is a, I mean these days I, I I talk about another concept from Dennett which is um, which is which is this uh, this idea of the design space. I don't know whether you are familiar with with that notion. Oh, yeah, I'm a big fan of Dennett. Uh, I'm sure many people in the uh, audience are as well. Yeah, so 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 the, if, if we look at the at the, the postmodern city or even the, the kind of late modern city or the, the city that we that we grew with, which is the city of the tabula rasa where where things can be changed overnight uh, by the decision of the of the architects, where architecture becomes um, uh, in a way uh, submits to some sort of design space. So, in a certain environment, in a certain uh, in a certain uh, condition, uh, certain types types of buildings uh, work, and others don't work at all. And therefore, no matter how different they are, they 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 are just kind of thrown away. Uh, so, so the idea that that uh, that there is this kind of Evolutionary idea of an archi- of an architecture in which we are all um, subject to certain rules, to certain uh, uh, to certain uh, uh, solutions, to certain forms, to certain organizations that that operate effectively uh, in, in in those conditions is is for me maybe one of the of the things that I would uh, that I would like to uh, to claim. Uh, and and the, this this is uh, I mean the, the design space I, I put the design space as a kind of a, a reaction against the representation of difference that that much of the neoliberal architecture has has become or has been. Okay, uh, let me I ask. Think that's, uh, I just want to I, in a way I just want to come in here with a blunt uh, a blunt instrument and ask you if you just so we could state. Uh, we could create a landscape, a, a Minecraft landscape of, you know, a couple of integers. Can I say this, or let's just say, I will say something and you will tell me how I'm wrong and you'll try to keep it to a few words. On one level, it sounded like you were calling polemical the idea that you would like to posit incrementalism over and against accelerationism. Exactly. All right, nah, good. <laughs> Uh, no, no, I think that's, if I, if I pick that up, I think that's very fascinating. Except that I don't want to argue against that. I want to get on your <laughs> side. But I would, no, if only because it's more interesting than the garbage we hear about the other side. That's for sure. Uh, also, because you invoke Dennett and then the design thing is that ultimately, and I'm going to say this for our audience, you are invoking um, evolutionary theory. And if you thought that that was a topic that I was going to uh, seek to argue against, I don't know where you got that idea, man. We no, no, idea. no, 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 no. I know, I know that you you are like, a, like, but you are into that stuff, and I think you have you have very uh, kind of uh, 
kind of uh, well-known ideas about evolution and uh, oh, Darwinism. Don't hold my 90s and, and so on. Hey, don't hold my 90s against me. You know, uh, every, <laughs> every young, ar- every, every young, every once young architect today looking for a voice, really just, uh, they use that. They hold it against me. Terrible. Uh, it doesn't matter. You know, we were there together. That's the point I want to make for the audience. Uh, make no mistake. Uh, make no mistake. The shit that I was talking about didn't happen until Alejandro basically graduated and uh, let's just say a kind of a posse emerged. No, no, this is absolutely true, guys. No, really, it's important for you guys all to understand is um, my visit to Harvard when I, this is, this is just before I started teaching there. Oh, fuck, I don't know how many years ago, maybe 20. Oh my God, it was 30, 30 years ago. Nearly, uh, nearly 30 years ago. Nearly 30 years ago. <laughs> Fuck, it was 1993. But, um, you know, my the visit they brought me in for was, it was Ram Kohlhaas's uh, thing. Anyways, the first studio, they the first thesis project they sat me down in front of was Alejandro's. And that was... Uh, <laughs> oh, you're dead it, was, wrong. it was more or less like wrong. that, yes. You're dead it wrong. Was it was yours. That's, no, 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 I it's true. That, 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 they that grabbed really me true. by the arm. Rem came up. He grabbed me by the arm. And he took me over your project and he started going. And there was a formal, I'm not going to say who, there was a formalist hard ass sitting there. And he asked, he asked, uh, I don't get this project. Like, I don't even know where the front door is. That's that amazing time. that you remember that. Oh, I remember. Oh, my God. I remembered very well <laughs> because I almost lost my job. I basically, I went crazy. I fucking went crazy. But the nice part of it was I got to I got to um, I got to defend your project in a way that ate up every all the rest of the time until, uh, you know, until the other guys came back in. I remember the way your project uh, was organized. It start. I'm, by the way, I'm not on a tangent here because I'm remembering it. I'm remembering what I did. I remembered that what mattered about a project is where the inside penetrated uh, where the outside entered not where you enter and there was a symmetry break there was a vortex that began there was a break in the homogeneity of the surface on the on actually on the upper surface of the thing and then there was this uh if you like almost uh, there was a vortex a turning that was taking place etc cetera, etc cetera. now why i want to bring that up of course is because that was a uh, student project which uh, was already beginning to deploy um, a kind of convection, uh, which uh, a convection structure um, in a medium, which um, was the first intuition that one had at this time in history of what one could call an active, and correlated space. Now I saw it there because I was preparing a book which later came out, I've been working on it already for years, which was uh, zone uh, six, um, which was all about this new model of, uh, of space which was emerging, which was the biological center. That's not the point. The point here though is that uh, it took until there were people like Alejandro and a few others out there producing work. And of course, what was fascinating is it didn't take Alejandro and at that time Farshi very long to produce a work of public work that we could then refer to, which was the wonderful um, uh, ship terminal, um, Yokohama ship terminal, which provided for us actually a a foil uh, around which, on which, within which, if you like, to expand the speculations and the transformations that we believed that this kind of study was uh, occurring. So we really needed that. It didn't matter that the ages were different. It was almost beautiful that, but we did, it did require the production of work that could relay uh, the ideas. So I'd like to say, to get back to this evolution idea and the, and the mess out of which evolution basically grabs and draws its forms. And in terms of this incrementalism versus the, um, 
ex, uh, the uh, what's it called accelerationism, which is really one of the most vulgar uh, excuses for a philosophy um, that uh, can be even imagined in the 20th in the 21st century. But it's out there nonetheless, and it certainly has attracted the attention of many students. I think the polemic here is important. And I'm going to I'm trying to create some fireworks for uh, for Neil Leach to uh, for us all to singe our hair in. But in terms of this idea, so guys, there's another term, that's a term that is similar to incrementalism, which I would like to bring up since uh, I want to help Alejandro here uh, turn this into a real uh, polemic or a fireworks show or actually a shit show is better than a fireworks show. Um, and it's a term that I picked up long ago from parkour, from parkour um, practice and theory. And when you see a parkour video on uh, YouTube, of course your jaw drops and all the other physical and chemical experiences happen throughout your body and it's an amazing thrill um, and it's staggering on every level. But when you actually study parkour and when you take your kids, for example, to parkour classes and some, you're very much struck by the fact that it's a bit like reading the profound philosophy of Bruce Lee and beginning to get the ultimate insights into exactly what his fighting style was all about. Because in parkour, all those outrageous moves, those anti-gravitational moves, those 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 uh, encounters with death, those joyous encounters with death, have all been practiced and rehearsed. But not only that, but not hundreds of times. But in fact, the rule in parkour, if you ever go to a manual or a thing, or you will find that the rule in parkour is gradualism, incrementalism, every single one of those moves has been practiced thousands of times, each time making it one inch longer. And it's an amazing thing. It's just an amazing thing to realize that these forms are the result, shall we say, of a kind of, uh, a kind of discipline, an incrementalist discipline. Having said that, the two most, shall we say, the two most influential terms in evolutionary biology um, of the last few decades, and these were more or less introduced by uh, Stephen Jay Gould. Um, uh, one of the, well, what, I mean, controversial for sure. One of them, in terms of the relationship between incrementalism and accelerationism, uh, and I'm pretty sure most of the people will have heard these terms before. The one is exaptation, exaptation, which was a term that um, was introduced by Elizabeth Verba and by uh, Stephen Jay Gould, I think sometime in the 1980s. Oh, actually, there wasn't just Verba and Gould. There was also, uh, what's his name? Another guy from the Museum of Natural History who belongs as one of the authors of that idea. But it was a very profound idea. And the idea was simply that changes, or shall we say features, um, happen according to one logic in the biological world. And that's to say certain properties and certain features, even certain organs will appear even because they accompany other ones that were selected. But we, they don't have a use until the environment by chance later changes and those features which were, which were basically stagnant and unactivated, but nonetheless present because they were swept along with other adaptations that were required for the organism or for the species uh, to survive, which is to say out of the design space, certain things came along with it and only later became activated or engaged that handshake with the environment or with history uh, took place later. So it is also interesting to note that the emergence of a feature can be sudden, that's to say, or rather it can be tracking temporalities in other, which were not the original temporalities, if you like, which brought the um, feature into existence. The second one is when um, Stephen Jay Gould decides to accentuate something that most evolutionary biologists knew, but that was is that there were these moments 
where there were explosions. And he refers to the Cambrian explosion, which was in terms of a historical design space, it was a moment in history, the Cambrian period, especially the late Cambrian period, when for some reason, the architects of life were going crazy and they were generating trillions upon trillions of uh, experimental forms and experimental body plans, but with full awareness that it was simply a way of testing the environment. Um, and what it did, it ensured the success of life because if the environment was going to start to turn over in any kind of a rapid or frightening or explosive way, there would be almost certainly forms that would be adapted to it. So what happens is the Cambrian explosion or the explosion of forms takes place and trillions of forms are introduced and then the environment prunes them and selects them. And then we are left with a single fundamental mammalian body plan where previously there were probably hundreds upon hundreds. But the fact of the matter is, is then the destiny changes because frankly, what happens very often, even though certain features can continually return, for the most part, certain doors get closed. So anyway, what I really like to say here is that in, the vi in this environment of incrementalism, if we wish to develop it, it's important to also note, we need a great deal of non-homogeneous, shall we say, descriptions, which allow for the freedom, for the freedoms, if you like, of innovation, which can take place at any old rate and not only be subject to that particular incrementalist rate. So frankly, it's wonderful to figure this out, but there's a lot of work more to do. And I say this to the guy who wrote a book called, or rather who put together a book called FOA's Ark. Can I just, just, just step in. I, I just, I think the theme of explosion, you know, what is amazing is that we're all in our own spaces and um, I'm here in LA and every now and again, there's a helicopter going overhead. And I don't know if it's a police helicopter and it's chasing a, you know, whatever, a murderer or whether it's maybe a, a scene from a movie or something, you don't really don't know. And uh, we've had these explosions going outside. I don't know, people have, have got, a, for some reason, their, their, their fireworks go, you don't know if they're fireworks or if they're, uh, um, if they're actual sort of gunshots, you've got no clue at all. And, and that, to my mind, you know, dealing with this kind of weird, I think that's why context, context is so important, dealing with this weird situation in the context of LA, it's kind of okay, you know, I, I, it's like normal, but I, I'm kind of thinking with a sedate Cambridge, I mean, not Cambridge, Massachusetts, Cambridge, England, where I, you know, I've lived for much of my life. How do you deal with this kind of weird, um, things that are happening. And, and, and in the States, it's almost like a natural evolution. I mean, once you've got the situation where the president of the United States is kind of saying racist comments and some porn stars making comments on, on his physiognomy, you're in a kind of, you're in a new terrain completely. And we, we, suddenly it's coming ramped up in this weird, weird world. And, you know, the, the theme of accelerationism is, is, is to my mind, a kind of that's what's happening in kind of weird, but it's been accelerated. Culture's been accelerated in a sense of way. I wanted to pick up, I didn't know, Alejandro mentioned that Steve Bannon was taught in the School of Architecture. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know at all. But I wanted, what I find interesting is that, that Steve Bannon and uh, Nick Land, I don't know if you guys know Nick Land. Nick Land used to be a very respectable, I don't know about respectable, but, well, anyway, he was a, 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 a professor of philosophy at the University of Warwick when I was a first an academic, and he was doing Deleuze. And suddenly something happened. We spoke about this Sanford and I the other day. Something weird happened where you go for you go from extreme left and extreme right in the same way that frankly Patrick Schumacher's gone, um, which is weird in itself. But apparently Nick Land and Steve Bannon are people who respect each other. Apparently Nick Land respects Steve Bannon and vice versa. It's almost like this is the landscape in which we're operating today. And it's kind of like, you know, coming from that. You know, from sedate Cambridge, I'm just trying to deal with this and, and think, well, what is what is what is going on? Because I think it is, I mean, it is almost like this is the maybe it's not, it's just a continuation of what we've been used to over the last few years. It's it's turned into this kind of weird file file, but it is a shit show already. Well, um, let me tell you about a shit show, Neil. I want to tell you shit show, you're gonna love this story. I'll try to make it really brief and tell you the longer version of it later. Steve Bannon once offered me a million dollars. And uh, he phoned me up. 
got me on the phone, offered me a million dollars to make a film for him. And you're gonna be very shocked by this. The film he wanted me to make was a film about the future of warfare. And I said, why the hell are you calling me? He said, because I know you published that book, War in the Age of Intelligent Machines. And I said, well, yeah. And he said, that was a fucking fantastic book. And I said, I want you to make a film uh, with me. And he said, I can get you a million dollars tomorrow if you will fly out here and come talk to us. And I can get you access to people in the military beyond what any journalist in the United States can get. Because, you know, he explained to me that he had worked for one of the top admirals. He was the right-hand man for one of the top admirals in the U.S. Um, uh, Navy. Uh, so that started my long uh, relationship with, uh, with uh, Bannon. But the fact of the matter is, no, I did not take the million dollars. I did not make the film. But I, I, I saw him. I met him. I spent a fair bit of time with the guy for a while. So I know for a fact that there is that capacity. If you want to understand, if you want to understand what happened to Nick Land, you need to realize that there's something endemic about it, you know, that that Deleuzian thing is uh, is very, it's, uh, it can go south. It can go south. But, you know, the thing I get with Steve Bannon, the thing that what I find interesting is that it's like almost, he has a kind of agitprop approach. I mean, I, it, it, he doesn't have a history of being a kind of a progressive, you no know, Marxist thinker, but it's almost like that. You know, he's, he's kind of got that the further that you don't see on the left and he's applying it to the right. That makes it kind of weird in itself. I mean, there's something unusual in a person like that. I mean, I, I find him intriguing. Um, well, you know, he's a media person. Uh, we know when he was contacting me, which is quite a long time ago, his interest at that time as an investment banker working for a French bank uh, was to uh, begin um, is to begin investing in and making films. Um, and now, of course, you know, he's deeply involved in um, in news and news media, etc. Um, so I think that uh, I think that it's better to understand that this is a media, uh, that this is, this was, you know, the Trump administration began, you forget about that, but you forget it really began as a media um, thing. You know, Trump comes from television much more than he comes from being like, you know, a, a, a real estate developer, because he's very poor at that. He made far more money in media and on television. Now you have to understand as well that, um, that, that the, the shit did not, start a hundred days ago with the 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 pandemic uh the shit that uh, that zero is talking about is the shit that began at an in, indeterminate moment if you like in the past or let's say many indeterminate moments in the past which can be seen as a perhaps now as a kind of a unified moment i don't know what you guys think about that yeah, I mean, actually, that's what I was looking for. And I, I think what, what we have to kind of work on, which is not the understanding of kind of discrete or, or kind of um, trans of phenomena, but rather to, to build up models to be able to, to encompass a larger or, or a wider spectrum of phenomena. And I think that um, there are many that, that we have uh, borrowed or stolen or uh, undeveloped in architecture in the in the past 30 years but uh, now we encounter a reality in globalization that requires much more complex ones and uh, it, perhaps it's 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 a moment where we can flip the logic and and the, the form of these models must come from architecture itself rather than from outside architecture so I, I was wondering. I mean, that, that's the that's what I was requesting in terms of what what form of architecture can. Okay, I, I want to say one thing that. to provoke the rest of you. I want to say one thing about that. Is every time I heard the word architecture in in this particular forum, I said, "What the hell is that word doing here?" So I just really want to say is clearly what I believe we're all talking about is actually something that is supra urbanism. Uh, I think. I mean, I don't know whether I you know. Zero. Mm. We're not, I believe that's what it is. I, I believe that the way this fell, I was once an urbanist, Alejandro was once an urbanist, etc. And so forth. I think that uh, I think what you're talking about 
is is the shall we say is the transcendence of the architectural uh, uh, entity. Yeah, I mean, I would say a form of organization that can encompass very complex processes, right? I mean, in that sense, yeah, I can call it like that if you want. I, I don't know. I, I was, I was, I, I kind of agree with Santa. I, I, I'm not quite sure how relevant architecture itself is in the situation. But I was struck. by you know, I, th I think, I think the seeds of this have been around for a while. I would agree with Santa. And, and I, I would almost go back to the kind of art scene. I think in the 1990s there was a thing called the Sensation Exhibition, where the the Chapman Brothers were doing these kind of weird uh, dystopian kind of. Uh, in installations, they were completely apocalyptic. You know, it's Bruegel kind of in a way. We had sort of, and we had Damien Hirst with kind of sharks in formaldehyde. It, it seems to me that that's the root of what's kind of coming from in some strange way. And I just, I wonder, we had this discussion this morning about the fact that Hitler came back from an art world. And he also, like Steve Bannon, of course, was cons obsessed with the media presentation. Lenny Riefenstahl, for goodness sake, no, Hugo Boss, all the SS were dressed in the Hugo Boss outfits. And, 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 and Albert Speer was completely complicit in that whole thing, to what extent could we could we kind of see it as kind of some kind of media spectacle operation that has its kind of sublime dystopian moment to it? Yeah, but isn't isn't this precisely what uh, uh, the exploration of uh, of uh, these technologies may may produce precisely to to as an antidote against this media circus that has led us to where we are. I mean, the, the, this is why I'm claiming a, a kind of return to some sort of scientific truth, whatever that uh, means. And that's why I'm claiming that uh, architects um, are not about making a, a show uh, every time they, they do a building, but about relating very precisely was to, to, a, to a kind of uh, slowly moving design space that can capture the forces in in a, in a given environment, and I believe that the forces in this given environment, if if you look at what what people are, I mean, like people, not architects, but but people out there are are interested in, is primarily conservation, preservation, uh, re, 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 uh, resilience. Uh, so it's is 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 the is the opening of an entirely new time of of operation for architects. So before it was all about very quickly producing the new, very quickly producing a new a new uh, possibility. Now I think is is about something else. It's very interesting that Sanford mentioned the the Cambrian explosion, which I had heard before uh, from from Jeff Kibnis. I mean, maybe maybe Jeff uh, heard it from you. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, but Jeff talks about the Cambrian explosion as, as this incredible, incredibly interesting moment in which the the environment was so rich that that actually that produced uh, suddenly the the evolution of many different types of of species. And then they all collapsed. And what we may have gone through is that Cambrian explosion of a, of a moment of uh, whatever free credit uh, development of technologies that has generated this very rich environment that enabled architecture to 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 believe that it could go almost anywhere. And I think that that this moment is the moment to think maybe architecture cannot go anywhere all the time. It needs to to, to uh, understand itself and its operation as a, as a kind of uh, incremental movement in, in the design space. I mean, I, I, I wish I had your optimism that, that, that technology would slow things down and be an antidote to this. I, I, my experience has been the opposite. No, it just, it just facilitates things and, it, and it's kind of potentially speeds things up. If you think the way that kind of information is just instantaneously spread, you know, it goes on social media, media and within about you know, 30 seconds, everyone, about 5,000 5, people have heard about something. It's causing in some ways kind of trauma that these, these things are so instantaneous. I think there's a, a kind of speeding up in some way and, and with it a kind of an amnesia. And, and so I, I don't think it's going to slow down. Um, I mean, maybe- But, maybe but, but look at, but, but, I mean, the, the, this is interesting because I, I look at the situation where we are at now, this situation would not be possible without uh, without certain 
the, the existence of certain type of technologies like the, the internet, et cetera, et cetera. So I, don't you think that the effect of these technologies in architecture is precisely the fact that we are now all at home uh, and we couldn't hold this conversation at home before? So the, the, in a way, the quality of the space, whether it is a domestic space or, a, or, a, or an employment space or a commercial space, has has in some way become irrelevant. Maybe maybe the space is something that and and, and you see that uh, in cities being transformed by by fiber optics, as opposed to that done by highways. Uh, so the, the the effect of the of the technology of um, of uh, of highways and and automobiles in the fifties radically transformed the physical nature of cities and possibly architecture, I think that the technologies that we have now are gonna to tend towards uh, forms of architecture that are much more stable and forms of urbanism that are much more stable and that actually do not change that quickly any longer. But my suspicion is that we're gonna be in a kind of Russian constructivist period for some time. I'm not quite sure how much construction is going to go on. I think we're going to be, there's going to be some crazy stuff for sure. But I, you know, I, I just, I, I think one of the things I would say is, sure, we are in a domestic setting. You know, we're all in our kind of cozy homes. But there was something I raised in one of our previous discussions was that actually it's weird when you're speaking to your laptop and, and, and it's coming from a, from a Catholic country, you'll know about the confession. No, you go along and you, <laughs> you can't see the priest, right? And you, you don't know who the hell you're talking to. There are 1,000 people right now on Billy Billy listening to us and we, can't, we are not aware of that. And we kind of say these indiscreet things perhaps that get spread around the word. And I think that's really part of this whole thing. And one of the things I'd say about technology is they, this is again repeating again a comment I made before, is they discovered that, you know, with these people with post-traumatic stress disorder, order they are very happy talking to ai bots because they somehow they can disclose their innermost secrets and i i think what's happening now is we're getting this unbelievable kind of openness and and and, and ex freedom of expression that's kind of leading to this kind of like adding to the situation shit show in, in an interesting way don't get me wrong so all the kind of repressed politeness has somehow disappeared and that's part of the whole the whole question i don't know sarah you must be brought up a yeah, you, yeah no i <laughs> <laughs> from the no, Pope's I that, country. Um, I, again, I, I think that the question of slowness that you're bringing, Alejandro, is interesting. I, I think that that doesn't necessarily mean regression or 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 no. conser conservatism as such. It means, in a way, uh, just literally slowing down and and constructing more robust forms of of encompassing reality, you no, know, or, or dealing with reality. And uh, and and again, I think that. Uh, there is a there is a huge amount of inertia that we have built that has been built within the body of architecture as as it came up to be not as, not, as, not as it used to be and that it can operate as a sort of robust medium to model reality uh, rather than searching for 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 those models outside of the of the discipline so yeah in that respect I think that the, the question of slowness, even, even the projects that you were, show, you were showing, they appear to be simple, but they're actually quite complex. I mean, formally speaking as well. I mean, they are, they are um, quite uh, strange. And there is a lot, put it into the, a lot of effort put into the construction of simplicity as well. Uh, well, I mean, the, 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 this is the whole thing about the detail. No? The, like, mm -hmm. like, in some ways, it doesn't really matter what is the formal complexity of the of, of the appearance of, of the kind of simple appearance of, of the building? Because there are incredibly sophisticated ecologies that are playing on an entirely different scale. I mean, the whole project of the envelope was exactly about that, about understanding where the detail is able to to engage with uh, with um, with broader ecologies, perhaps than than. Than the canon, than the kind of uh, architectural uh, canon. So that that minute attention to the detail, which I think is replicated in uh, in uh, sensing and in artificial sensibilities, is is for me another one of the things that may actually ground. Uh, a, 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 I don't know if if I can say a rebirth of architecture, but but a kind of re 
re-origination re of architecture uh, in, uh, on a different, uh, on a different uh, mode, or on a different tone uh, to the one that has been driving us. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, saying I, I was not interested in novelty. I mean, obviously we all come from a generation that was, that grew in this, this kind of uh, idea that, that we can build the, the city from scratch, that we, 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 we grew up in, in the idea that, that cities can transform immediately the, the, the world. Uh, and, and architects uh, have the, the, the role of, uh, of uh, reinventing them constantly. And I, yeah. I think that is one of the things that may actually uh, change. I mean, architecture, I, I, I think that one of the problems we have is that architecture has become fundamentally politically incorrect. Mm. I mean, like 20 years ago, an archi the architect was a kind of a little king that was transforming the world at, uh, at, uh, at his uh, or hers, uh, um, you know, uh, imagination. But, but, but now, now I think an ar the architects are, are kind of people who waste resources, who uh, are like a cog in the wheel, uh, are kind of always producing disturbance, and uh, and I I don't know whether we can we can afford to to remain in that uh, in that uh, position. So I'm 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 uh, I'm suggesting that maybe the shit that means to recognize that we can no longer be uh, understood as uh, as the the heroes uh, of of the modern world, maybe will will get us to 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 a new place. And I think this is a moment in which these uh, these consciousness may may actually coalesce into something. Let me just uh, throw something in. I mean, I wish I had this kind of uh, this <laughs> assurance you have of the rebirth. I, I'm actually doing a, writing a book right now called The Death of the Architect, which actually was talking about how AI could basically take over architecture. And, and of course, you know, uh, uh, my publisher, I said, is that too extreme? The publisher said, no, no, people want to hear about death. They, they love it. You know, it's, it sells, books sell, right? And, and now I'm worried that, you know, you're going to, you're going to Google the word death of the architect and, and you're getting all these kind of Michael Sorkin, all these famous figures all dying. And then we get this situation whereby, you know, that uh, uh, Michael, uh, Thomas Heatherwick saying that, I think that the architectural office is dead. You know, basically, will people go and in, in, into this office in the old way? That it, we're going to be distributed in a different sort of way. So I think I think what's going to happen, and and, and I, I mean, it's already all the predictions about robots taking over. Well, COVID nineteen has made that more extreme. That the people in factories that they're, they're being displaced by robots because robots are safer in the age of COVID nineteen. I think with this, with the kind of the, the collapse of the economy that's going to happen to a profession that's already struggling and it's on its knees, it's absolutely on its knees. That we well could could well see actually the death of architecture as as, as we know it. And uh, and I think that's 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 disturbing. But you know that's maybe evolution and and things have gone away and disappeared that, that without us realizing it. Uh, but they've happened. When I, I mentioned before that one of my talks that when I was a student you know you go you go to a travel agent and you want to travel somewhere and you go and buy some films and things and you come back and you get the films developed that doesn't happen travel agents have all gone you book things online you don't even have camera shops because they're all everything's every phone has got a camera and you certainly don't get your films developed I think that we, we the think that to hold on to cling on to this idea that we as architects going to live on forever I I, I I think the profession is seriously under 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 problem uh, under stress and I've seen some results just today um some of the final results coming out of the workshops. So astonishing things being produced uh, in AI generated forms in Daniel Bolojan's workshop. Amazing, you know? I, you know, I think we're at a, at a point of disruption where things are gonna be thrown up in a different sort of way. The world is not gonna go back to normal. And maybe that's a good thing. I mean, Black Lives Matter is here uh, and that's important. And maybe even a kind of importantly, you know, in terms of education, since we're all involved in education, you know, I think the fact that we've launched this platform that's been incredibly successful where it's free education, are we gonna now challenge the kind of the, the incredible fees that you have to pay to go and go to places like GSD and so on. I suspect that we're going to, it's going to be one of these kind of watershed moments, you know, that's going to be a bit like after the second world war, when we can, when certainly in the, in the UK, that the national health service and all these things came in, we, things will change completely. I don't think it's going to go back to normal. And I don't think that we can assume that architecture itself is going to, is going to survive in, in the way it used to. Um, I, so I don't have that confidence. 
Yeah, well, I, I was also thinking in that respect, Alejandro, what's your faith in the detail coming or, or where do you locate the faith in the detail in terms of two sides that I think are in a way uh, very close to the problem. One is the preciousness of detail. The other is the, the kind of hard, hardcore engineering of detail. I think both of them are problematic in, in a way. I mean, like the first one would, would imply a sort of fetishization of detail as per se. The second one would be a kind of, would, would also imply uh, equally the other end, which is the kind of giving up of, of a form of, of specific expertise, expertise of architecture. So where do you locate that, that notion that is neither one nor the other? Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm obviously much more interested in the engineering detail than in the, than in the kind of preciousness, ornamental uh, mm -hmm. uh, detail. Uh, and, and the reason why I'm, I'm now particularly interested in that at this very moment is because I think that the, the, the detail is something that connects the building to, to a wider ecology. And I think that engineers are much better than architects at that. So they are looking at the detail as, as how the building is, is able to regulate the movement of energy through the skin, or they are much more able to understand or, or to, to, uh, to generate the way in which the building collects water. Or so that that kind of engineering detail that is perhaps not as visible as as the as the architectural gesture. I mean, I, I, I these days I say I, I don't want to do cantilevers any longer because I, I think I mean, it's kind of banal uh, technique to make buildings look amazing, but we all know that the cantilevers are not a big deal any any longer. But there, there are levels of sophistication when you are designing a, a, a facade that, Im that immediately connect to much wider ecologies. In the same way that, that the, the distance between the eye and the nose when you are, um, when you are captured by a, by, a, by a facial recognition camera becomes suddenly much more informative uh, and, and effective as a tool than, than, uh, than, you know, whether you are smiling or you are uh, f uh, uh, frowning. Uh, uh, so is that kind of minute attention that I, 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 I think is, 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 for me right now, incredibly important to penetrate as a, as a domain <clears throat> of engagement for, uh, for architects, I think the problem is that we have not we have not engaged there. I mean, I, when I started doing the the, the work on, uh, on the envelope, um, you know, and I was a, a practicing architect, I didn't know the 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 rules, or not 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 the rules, but the the effects that that folding a piece of aluminium in a certain way would have in terms of how the building performs. Um, uh, in terms of uh, 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 controlling the, the, the pre uh, pressure equalizing the facade, for example, uh, to, to give you, I, have no, I had no idea. Now I know a little bit more. And I think uh, by doing that work, I've discovered that actually these minute details are incredibly powerful in terms of locating the building uh, within larger ecologies. And yet we haven't been able to turn them into a into a uh, in, into a, uh, a form of expression of the building, so the public at large is much more interested in cantilevers and and curvy shapes. Uh, quite frankly, they are now much more able to understand architecture as that than arch architecture as something that contains many much more complex things that are happening on a on a different scale which I believe now become incredibly uh, important. Well, that's what we need to talk about because honestly, you know, uh, shop talk is not what people are gonna wanna hear, especially if you no. like in a, in a, in a broader uh, 
in a broader, uh, you know, people looking for something that, shall we say, that helps direct their being, that helps direct their existential uh, understanding, for example, uh, and their connection to time and history. Because I have to say, you know, it's amazing just how plastic the mind and the brain is, is that a hundred days, the way we've been living, you can barely remember or believe that the future will, will feel, you can barely believe the world before, and you can barely believe that there's a moment in the, you can't even project a moment in the future when we're going to be flying to the same city again, when we're going to be staying in hotels and sharing meals again and meeting for breakfast before the conference, where we're going to be passing the same coffee cup to each other, um, where we're, you know, uh, you know, that whole thing, that whole universe. So the fact of the matter is we are already radically adapted or adapting, shall we say, to this, uh, situation. There are emotional issues for sure. There are all kinds of things. But the fact of the matter is, while we're here, uh, to the degree that we are architects, we should change how we speak, if you like. Change the, to the objects and the, I like this term actually, change the chunks to which we pay attention, the chunks of the real, of the real world. And um, I guess there's no other way. You mentioned something. It's always shocking to hear it. It may be the most banal thing in the world. You mentioned, whenever did we have these conversations in our houses and homes? Homes is the word. That's a better word. Whenever did this type of connection from home ever happen? Now, I have to say, you know, my home is a fucking shit show, if I can invoke it. You know, we've got three big, ample rooms, and they really felt wonderful until this happened. Now there's four people in three rooms, which means I, I'm the dog. I'm the guy who doesn't <laughs> get, uh, you know, each kid gets a classroom, and, uh, you know, they go to school in it. My wife, you know, she speaks to patients in, the, in one room, and I'm the guy who basically, you know, I get... I don't know what I do. I clean and I cook. But the point, though, is that when I have to reserve a couple of hours, you know, everybody needs to adapt around me. And sometimes they hear me talking and they say, who the hell is that? Is that what daddy sounds like when he's fucking, you know, doing his job? They've never heard that before. Except I'm embarrassed just, that they heard it. Can I just pick up on that? I, you know, the way that is being more honest in some ways. I mean, I, I really respect Alejandro's architecture. It's really, I'm, you know fantastic stuff but in a way be talking about details in a time like this is like fiddling while Rome's burning right I mean it, it reminds me of my kind of like my education in Cambridge is all about you know the Baroque this kind of cozy historical cocoon the Baroque well in the Baroque what was going on there were slave owners you know women you know there was racism they were kind of like women didn't have any vote and so on and so on you know let's get back to the right reality that's why I thought that uh, Sanford's kind of comment about what it was like in the 19th, 18th century the kind of stench on the other shit and the street that is really the reality that we should be dealing with right now rather than hiding away in some kind of cocoon talking about architecture it seems to me that we really are in a shit show and, and really the best way to, to address it is is as it is yeah but i mean, for, 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 I mean yeah. are, are you saying that the the, the details are not uh, relevant because I'm, i i would say exactly the opposite i would say it is in the detail where you can you can reduce the 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 heat island effects. It is in the detail where you can reduce the energy consumption. So the the effect of these of these um, almost imperceptible uh, um, uh, designs or gestures has a much deeper impact in much bigger ecologies than than maybe the the, the public saying oh that building looks cool. I, I, I agree. I agree. I totally agree. Absolutely. You know, God is in the details. But the point is, I'm not sure there'll be much of a profession of architecture in about three or four years time. You know, the, if there's no detail, there's no God. We're in a kind of a completely different operation. That's why I think it's a kind of it's an emergency situation. I don't know. Uh, uh, Samba, what do you think? Well, I don't know what to tell you. First of all, let me say this. Uh, Sometimes a little acceleration can do a lot of good, and I'm glad that we're doing that right this very moment. Uh, I will say this, though, is that anybody who thinks this is over in less than at least another 10 or 12 months is dreaming, is dreaming. Uh, there will be a few places like New Zealand that get to uh, 
you know, that get to, uh, that get to relax. But I believe that uh, the, the situation as it's developing in many places in the world, and first and foremost, the United States, guarantees, it's already, there's a point of no return. It already guarantees 10 more months at the very, very minimum. Now that is, that is fully three times longer than we've already endured. Plus, uh, we don't know what the cumulative uh, effect uh, is going to be. For example, when they talk about second waves, we know the behaviors, the collective behaviors in the second wave are going to differ radically from the first wave. We also know that the discourses of resistance is weird and misplaced. As they are. So anyway, bottom line is that. That is true. It is also true. Pedagogy. Pedagogy has been transformed. Frankly, I would actually like to say that it was transformed by this very week of conferences. I'm not going to go into the details about it because it's just not right for the fire for the fireworks show. But I will say that the classroom was the classroom was undone in a way that it had been waiting to be undone, but uh, it got undone this week. I feel it very powerfully, um, not because the international makeup in our school, especially, is any different, really, really. I mean, I had, I have, every year I teach a class in which there's not a single American in the class. Um, but, but, and, and the, I would say the way uh, the composition didn't differ substantially from the composition of this, of these forums. Uh, but the, the ability to reach the whole world in situ for the first time was very different for me. I always felt I had these students and they, I needed to provide the, the, the context that I was in, I had to make it available for them. And this is different because I now feel, I feel very powerfully. I felt powerfully in the, in the last the sets we have, there was, you know, a student from the rainforests of, of, uh, of South America. There was another student from, um, there was a whole set of students from Iran, for example. There, and then, of course, I'm always aware of what's, uh, what's going on in Los Angeles, um, and so on and so forth. The fact of the matter is their contexts felt urgent, immediate, real, in, in the real space-time of the exchange, which was very, very different than how it is otherwise. And it felt to me like I had finally discovered the, the, new, the meaning, if you like, of the, of the shifts that were happening, you know, in the, in the transformation of the demographics. Um, and the, frankly, the fact that architectural discourse, all humanities discourse, in fact, is no longer Western at all. Um, Go ahead. You know, can I just take on that? I mean, I think, you know, that, uh, that there is a crisis. I mean, what has surprised me is it surprised me is that, I mean, I was on WeChat and watching what was going on in China back in January, and, and I was just amazed that no one was paying any attention to this. So the Western world could have geared up for it. And in fact, they were just kind of, they're in this kind of slumbering co cocoon and suddenly it hit, you know? And we're now in a situation where, where education, I'm getting people telling me, I don't know if I got a job next, 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 next semester. No, literally. And these are people who are lifelong academics, famous people with a kind of tenure and so on. Now, the, that world is being disrupted. Now, the point is that Sanford is kind of like, you know, you, what we're seeing is kind of, uh, students around the world, in the past, they have come to America. They have come to America or they've come to the, to the Bartlett or the AA or whatever. That's been a kind of a whole industry that is collapsing. People will not be coming and doing that anymore. And, and that's going to lead to sort of a crisis in some ways. So I think you've got to realize that this is, this is a, a watershed moment when things are not going to return to normal they're not going to be the same and, and you know i think my prediction a few months ago people were kind of like thing what are you talking about was there's going to be a, a new iron curtain a new iron curtain um because there are some countries in which covid is going to be running wild people will not be allowed from those countries into other countries and i can't go back to to the uk right it's not like i can't go to china soon America is going to be in this kind of situation where it's going to be cut off. And if that doesn't lead to an economic collapse, and if an economic collapse doesn't lead to an architectural collapse, I don't know what will. 
I think we're facing a crisis and it, it is a shit show. And if we, if, I mean, nice as details are, we're going to miss the point if we're, we're fiddling while Rome burns. I, I think we're in a situation now where of, of a real collapse, a, a potential collapse, and we need to take that seriously. Well, I, I, um, you're absolutely yeah. right. What is staggering, actually, is that you had to say it. Uh, because the economic reality, nobody's focusing it centrally anymore because the biological reality seems to be hogging all of the uh, attention, the front, uh, the foreground of attention. The econ, I mean, first of all, there are no interesting, there have, to my mind, I mean, I have not seen any interesting economic analyses yet but the economic devastation is, is unspeakable. It's unspeakable. And that was alluded to in the first six or seven weeks. And now it's more or less been completely forgotten, which basically means nobody's minding the house and it's getting worse. So I think you're absolutely right. The fact of the matter, though, is that this is of such magnitude that we can't even imagine exactly what it means. The best you can do, and I don't think anyone can do better than you just did, is saying the jobs are gone. The profession is gone. The field is gone. And, you know, when are we ever going to even build again? And when we do build, I don't think we're going to be building the same things. Um, that is uh, very, very possible. On the other hand, on the other hand, there's time to think and there's time to invent. There's time. Look, what happens in New York City, I am staggered by the fact that as we speak, I can hear the, uh, the, 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 what's it called? Manifestation, the French call it. Um, the demonstrations are forming right outside my door um, as I speak. Uh, it, you know, this big holiday weekend is going to have a whole lot of demonstrations. Demonstrating is the new social life, and it's not necessarily dismissible. It's not dismissible for that. It will be, it, it's, 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 it's communion. Communion, it, uh, the communion, I didn't mean communion, it's community. It's everything. I don't know what the hell it is because I haven't had time to think about it. But I have to say, you know, that this is, uh, this is the economic collapse. And, it, and, and, and I mean, nothing, nothing, let's say, legitimately and realistically transforms existence right down to its very core than economic changes. And we're not academics, you know, uh, 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 spouting hot air in a room right now. We're merely trying to hold a mirror up to what the hell is going on for us to recognize the magnitude of it. I'm with you. I'm with you, man. I don't know where the, I, I can tell you something. Pain, pain is the new normal. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think that also that there is, there is an opportunity in that, not only in retirement or in, in, slowing down but in understanding the form of this or or constructing it actually so i think there is i don't know there is there is a flip side of, a flip side to it which is to to construct a way of modeling this no i mean i i don't think we have to to give that up i mean it's uh, it's our job to give form to it so well, you know what i liked would you consider what you did in terms of that shall we say almost Philip K. Dick um, monologue that you gave Ciro. Do you see that as creating form? Uh, I do. Yeah. So, <laughs> what, I, if I would have asked myself, what would it take to get an architect who runs a school to produce and deliver a text like that? If somebody had asked me that, you know, six months ago, I couldn't have come up with the. I couldn't have come up with the pathway that would have led to you writing and reading a text like that, except for, you know, one of these sort of exercises that happens at SciArc uh, on occasion. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So Neil, maybe we can give it a close. Do you yeah. Think? I mean, it's, I, I would just say this, you know, we, we are architects, we are designers, we are planners and um, we should be planning. We should be uh, not planning buildings, but planning strategies. How are we going to deal with a situation where there's going to be, I think, you know, what happens in New York, for example, when the property market, everyone's leaving the center of New York and, and the property market collapses, everyone's left with negative equity. And certainly no one's going to be kind of employing architects. They maybe they'll be doing 
doing suburban villas now. But you know, I think we should be preparing about it. And I think you know, that's one of the, the real challenges about architects. They don't think about things, they don't address these things. You know, it's it's on the horizon, it's been on the horizon for some time automation and AI and the impact, and I've seen no uh, refer references to that. In my lecture, I was talking about a, a book uh, about the future of architecture, the only book I could find, and it was a, a book, a hundred, uh, 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 the future of architecture, a hundred designs, as though it was going to be a question of aesthetics. It's not going to be a question of aesthetics, it's going to be a question of the, 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 the architecture of the economy itself. Uh, and that's going to be the issue rather than the architectural form. It's how we're going to ever find a way of operating in that situation. And I think I would go back to the to, to, the, to the First World War in some ways. I mean, there are two reasons why the First World War I think is really interesting. One is the fact that everyone went into it without knowing how long it was going to go on for. We don't know how long this is going to go on for. Se well, se second reason was there, was there was a Spanish flu thing that came after it, which is pretty much like what we've got now, not so dissimilar. And of course, right after that, the whole milieu was the, was the Russian Revolution. What came out of that was the most unbelievable uh, production of uh, imagination of architectural forms um, that was so inspiring uh, for architects, Rem Corlas and Zaha and so on. That's going to come out of this, I'm sure. But actual buildings, there'll be paper architecture. I don't think uh, actual buildings. So I think we need to sort of use our design, our planning capacity to plan for this and be aware of this thing. Because if we just talk about details, I mean, much as I love Alejandro's work, you know, I think we're fiddling while Rome's burning. Okay, but I mean, let, let, let me make a, 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 a another proposal, other than the detail, which I, I believe uh, is still uh, relevant because, because we will still have to uh, eventually build buildings, uh, maybe not for, for, for a few years, but, but, uh, but afterwards. I mean, one of the things, I mean, if we, if we try to think about what is happening to us now uh, and what may uh, imply for buildings, is that we will not, uh, I mean, does it make sense to make resi residences and, uh, and office buildings as two separate typologies or, or what we are going to see? And, and maybe that is related to what I was trying to, uh, to propose when, when saying maybe symmetry is, is uh, a form of organization that may again be uh, have uh, or gain uh, some some currency. Uh, I mean, aren't we look, uh, looking towards buildings that will potentially have an, an entirely ambivalent use, yeah. Yeah. Let, for I example? Think, yeah, no, I think ambivalent use is precisely that. We are now spaces, living rooms that become offices, right? To my mind, there are two areas I think architects could need could have opportunities. One is interactive space. Now, how do you allow that space to adapt in an interactive, intelligent fashion? The second thing is I'm quite convinced that this forum, this kind of space of, the, of, of, of Zoom, uh, useful as it is, is inadequate. You know, the, the possibility of imagining an, an AR, VR spaces in which we might be meeting, that's the kind of a, a way in which we can deploy our architectural imaginations in a realistic way. Let me throw that out there. <laughs> no, I would like to say something to add to this. I, I want to isolate just, this is really just to isolate one thing that Neil said. You know, this is not forever. That is for sure. And yes, we will come out of it. And it's just about certain as, it, as anything can possibly be, there will be another building frenzy at some point when the economy starts to reinsure it. Because there was this hiatus or this Sabbath but I call it a Sabbath, but that's for the architects. That's to say, how can one, what ought one to do? What types of activities, what types of, where should one direct one's practice and, 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 and attention, given that we may be looking at a few years, several years possibly, before the great explosion of building comes again? How can we best fashion ourselves anew how can we become different? How can we become the designers of that, of that emerging world? Uh, that's to say, how can we meet that moment, if you like, with freshness? I, um, well, first of all, I think it's inevitable that we will. But the question, of course, is, is what, uh, how, when, well, when we use that word opportunity, I would say we have an opportunity now, frankly, 
to cultivate something in ourselves. Uh, you know, I know what I'm doing, but again, again, I'm not a guy who needed a job in a, in an arch- in a design office or who depended so specifically on that economy. But I do think that uh, that's something that architects ought to think about. Let me just let me just chip in something there. I mean, I, I, I to my mind, I don't think we're not we're not going back to normal. We're not going to back to a pre Black Lives Matter age at all. It's going to stay, and we're not going to go back probably to the situation if we believe this guy Tony Fauci of even shaking hands. You no, know, the entire structure on which society has been built is going to be reconfigured. And if you think of, of, of architecture as a kind of exoskeleton that is kind of built up around a certain set of societal behaviors, that itself is going to be radically changed. And I think there will be some architecture in terms of adaptation, trying to m- model that new world, um, but it's going to change. And I, I think we've got to address that, that question. Yeah, yeah, well, in that sense, I think that, that constructing models that are generic enough and robust enough to deal with a number of scenarios, I think it's important, right? I mean, uh, in, the, in that sense, the call for, for simplicity or, or reductionism or, or uh, slowness that Alejandro was proposing, uh, I think it's an interesting way of, it, it, there is a form of archaism in that, that yeah. uh, is capable to kind of engage with an, a wider number of, of scenarios. Um, so I think that, that that's the wisdom of it, probably. Um, although I, I would say I would I would probably bet to a more complex version of that, or or let's say to a hidden complexity within that simplicity that is that makes it robust. Uh, but uh, I think it, it has to do with that, with the capability of dealing with different. Uh, possible scenarios in the future. Yeah, but that's that's what I you know what I liked about Alejandro's work in the past was the notion of scenario planning. You would imagine a kind of world in which it was operating. In other words, it was about the performances and the behaviors, the choreographies of space, less than the necessary the, the detail of the form. You know, and I think that's what we need to envision: the kind of new, the, the, the there's new scenarios in which we find ourselves, which will be radically different, radically different. I I, I you know Neil, I I have to say that I have never been that keen on scenario planning. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, I mean, in fact, I, I am, and I think the work has always been much more about planning for something that can deal and, uh, uh, with any kind of scenarios. And, and in that sense, a kind of return to a, to a form that is much more independent from functional scenarios. I, I, I would think that that is much more much more the, the kind of performance that I have been always interested in. And, and I think that at this particular moment, and this goes maybe along what uh, Ciro was, was reading, at that particular moment, that possibility for architectural form to be much more um, unspecific, much, much less driven by function uh, and much more driven by, by its own being and its capacity to engage perhaps with nature, perhaps with, uh, uh, you know, uh, warming or, or collecting water or, or insulating uh, from a certain temperature or ventilating and breathing is much more, uh, is going to become even more important. So in, in some ways I, I, I see, uh, maybe that's why I, to some degree I, I like it, but I see a, a, an opportunity to, to, to intensify certain traits of architecture that I have always been interested. And I, I, I can really uh, tell you that, that function has never been a central interest uh, the, the, the performances that, that, that I've always thought have, have been much more topographical and much more related to, to enclosure or to nature than, than to satisfy a certain functional need. And, and I, I think that the, 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 this kind of situation, which we are all at home uh, talking, is a, is a direct challenge to the, to the to the function as a as a determinal uh, uh, as a as a as a determining performance of uh, of architecture in the near future. 
I want to say what Alejandro said in three words, and that is for certain architects, they can't hide anymore. The cowardice, the laziness, the intellectual uh, dishonesty uh, that has marked the field in its terror of nature, in its terror of actually dealing with, yeah, there's no doubt about it. This is finally, finally cracked that, 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 uh, that jar for them. I agree, I agree, I agree. Sir, okay, I, so you want to close it, Neil? Yeah, Maybe. No, no, I mean, you, you, it, go ahead. So, <laughs> no, I think it's a very interesting discussion we had and thank you, Neil, for joining as well. And uh, hope seeing you again soon, guys. And, and you have a nice uh, end for the, for the sessions, uh, for the venue, Neil, and congratulations. Thanks. Yeah, it was a closing ceremony tomorrow morning at five o'clock in the morning, my time, eight o'clock. Uh, East Coast time. So um, thanks, Sarah. That was fantastic. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, guys. Andres. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. It was good to see you. Bye. Ciao.